Hello everyone, I'm Swaroop Kotni and in this talk, I'll briefly talk about how containers are being used by uh, cloud providers. In this talk, I'll briefly discuss the use case of containers and talk about popular containers, which are Docker containers and compare their performance with VMs. Then I'll do a case study of uh, creating special purpose containers uh, for a cloud offering called function as a service. Uh, first, let's look at uh, the user base for containers. Containers are primarily used by two groups. The first is the cloud providers. The cloud providers use containers as a lightweight isolation mechanism to co-locate workflow uh, workloads from different cloud users on the same machine. Uh, recently, some cloud services are using containers as the primary medium to create isolated environments. Uh, for example, containers are extensively used to uh, run functions uh, in a service called function as a service. It's also popularly known as serverless computing. Uh, we'll look at this use case a little later in the presentation. Uh, on the other hand, containers are also great tools for developers. Developers can develop code in a containerized environment and install all their code dependencies within the container. The developer can then save this container as an image and ship the image to uh, users. The users can then run the developer's code inside this image without worrying about which versions to install. Another important fact is that uh, containers are great for developers of all kinds. It doesn't matter whether they code in Python or Java or Node.js, one can set up a container for any runtime. Uh, hence uh, the, the huge popularity of containers amongst developers. A big reason for containers popularity can be attributed to Docker. Uh, Docker created a CLI to launch containers without effort. To compare the difference, let's revisit the container creation code used in the first half of this lecture. We created the file system for the sample container by downloading the root file system for Alpine Linux from a source. We then populated a rootfs directory on the host with contents of the uh, downloaded zip file. Next, we launched a bash uh, as a separate terminal. Uh, and it was a child process to the first terminal. We created new namespaces for this terminal using unshare. In this slide, we showed a new UTS and mount namespaces. Then uh, we used mount, pivot root and unmount to change the file system view for this terminal. Uh, lastly, we changed the host name of this terminal to sub zero. Uh, effectively with all this code, uh, we have created a container uh, with a single namespace. Notice the amount of code that is required uh, to, uh, to do just to create just one namespace. The amount of code required for all namespaces and C groups is much larger. On the other hand, Docker came up with a simple CLI uh, to launch containers rather easily. To create a container in Docker, all you have to do is issue a docker run command uh, with the appropriate flag values. Uh, docker has a flag for every namespace and C group. Refer to Docker manuals for uh, an information on all the uh, flags. In this example, we use three flags for uh, the Docker run command. The first sets the na uh, host name to sub zero. Uh, the second uh, set, sets the limits, uh, memory limits on the container to 512 MB. And finally, uh, we name the container as demo. Uh, so the container we are launching is created out of a base image, which is Alpine 3.10. Uh, so Docker uh, first looks for this image on the host machine. If it's not available, then uh, it downloads from this image from Docker Hub and launches containers based on the uh, image. Debugging Docker containers is rather simple. Uh, so the minus D flag uh, in the Docker run command denotes that uh, this particular container would be running as a daemon. Uh, so to log into this container, uh, we can simply uh, attach a bash uh, using uh, the docker exec command. Uh, so docker containers are pretty easy to launch and they are very easy to debug. Let's look at how docker containers perform compared to virtual machines. More specifically, let's look at how long it takes to boot a docker container versus how long it takes to start or boot a virtual machine. For this comparison, uh, we launched Debian uh, virtual machines 
on, a, on some host and uh, compare it with launching Docker containers on the same host. The green solid line represents our Docker boot time and the blue solid line represents uh, the Debian VM's boot time. Uh, notice that the time it takes to boot a container uh, remains constant irrespective of how many containers were already running on the given host. Uh, it takes a few hundred milliseconds to launch a container. On the other hand, uh, it takes a few thousand milliseconds uh, to launch a virtual machine. Uh, so launching a container it is at least 10 times faster than launching a VM. Uh, this difference only gets bigger uh, when the number of running guests on the host machine uh, increase. It takes uh, at least 100 times uh, more time uh, to launch a virtual machine when there are 100 uh, guests running already on the host. Now that we have seen how Docker containers perform compared to traditional VMs, we will discuss how they are being used in a cloud offering called Function as a Service. Further, we will discuss how we can optimize beyond Docker containers to improve performance and fast. Before we dive into optimizing containers for FAS, let's understand what exactly is FAS or Function as a Service. The unit of computation in FAS is a developer provided function. Functions are meant to be stateless, which means they do not require any a prior information to process an input. Requests to these functions can be made through several triggers, such as a HTTP request or publishing a message to a queue. Each request for the function is served by a container, and the cloud provider completely takes care of scaling the number of containers based on the request load. This way, the developers can completely focus on writing the functions and leave the infrastructure management to the cloud provider. Further, uh, the cost model of FAST is very attractive where the developer only pays per function usage. In other words, uh, the developer only has to pay for the amount of compute time consumed by the functions to process these requests. Uh, let me give you a simple example to uh, clear out uh, the understanding about FAST. Uh, so, the function, uh, I mean, let's consider a simple function that can be deployed on FAST. Uh, this function computes a SHA-256 hash on the input and stores the hash value in some database. So such a function is stateless because uh, the hash only depends on the input and we only have to publish to an external database. So uh, it's just an API call to a database. Such a function can actually be used by websites uh, when a user signs up to their site. Upon pressing the sign up button, the front end code can trigger a HTTP request to this function and pass in the username and password to the function. The function can then store the hashed value of uh, username and password in a database, which can be used to verify future logins. Uh, the request load to this function can vary depending on the usage of the website. Uh, let's say it's a shopping website, then the request load can be very high on holidays. Uh, on the other hand, on weekdays, the request can be very low. So the fast cloud provider uh, can basically scale up and down the number of containers used to process a request for this function based on the request load. Uh, so on weekends, uh, he might have to spawn 100 containers to serve requests for this function. Uh, whereas on weekdays, he might only have to spawn a single container to uh, process requests for this uh, function. Uh, this way, the cloud provider can also uh, smartly utilize the compute available to him by provisioning uh, containers, uh, CPUs to containers for uh, requests with, for functions with more requests. Uh, in FAS, uh, typically function execution times ranges from a few hundred milliseconds to a few seconds. So functions are very short running in FAS. Uh, in fact, in a survey conducted by Microsoft Azure, uh, they observed that 50% of the functions execute in less than one second. So this brings up an important uh, problem for containers because the function execution time is almost uh, in the same order of magnitude as the container startup time. Uh, and the developer actually only pays for the function execution time. Uh, so he does not pay for the container startup time. So this becomes an important problem uh, for the cloud provider because financially he'll be at a loss if uh, containers take a long time to start up. Uh, 
so this cold start problem of containers has motivated a lot of research towards tailoring containers for this particular uh, service, uh, functional service. So we, in the next few slides, uh, we'll look at one such uh, research solution uh, to tackle the problem of cold start in FAS. In this slide, let's look at the various stages of container startup and see how we can optimize each stage for FAS containers. Uh, all the contents of this slide are taken from SOC, uh, which is a paper in ADC 2018. Container startup for this particular analysis can be split up into uh, three phases. The first phase is to allocate storage for the container. Next, we create namespaces to logically isolate resources such as network, host details, user and group IDs. Finally, uh, containers create C groups to restrict its access to physical resources such as CPUs and memory. Uh, for the first stage, that is to allocate storage, it's again a two-step process. First, uh, we populate a subdirectory of the host file system with the data and code needed by the container. And second, we make this subdirectory the root of the new container. Uh, containers typically use logical copying to populate the file system. Uh, Docker, in fact, uses union file systems for this purpose. Uh, union file systems provide a layered composition mechanism and gives running containers copy on write access over underlying data. Uh, but a simpler alternative is bind mounting. Uh, bind mounting makes the same directory visible at multiple uh, locations in different containers. Uh, there's no copy on write capability, so the data that must be protected should be bind mounted as read only inside a container. Uh, figure one uh, compares binds to uh, layered file systems uh, by repeatedly mounting and unmounting many tasks in from many tasks in parallel. Uh, bind so uh, notice that bind mounting is at least uh, twice as fast as uh, union file systems. Uh, given fa functions in FAS are stateless, the functions do not write any uh, file in the container. Plus, functions run on base images maintained by the cloud provider. The base image can be mounted as read-only on the container. Uh, hence, bind mounting is a good alternative to union file systems specifically for fast containers. Uh, next, uh, to change the root directory for the container, uh, in the previous examples, we've seen how to use mount namespace. We used mount, pivot root and unmount uh, to change the directory or to change the root of the container. Figure 2 uh, shows the performance of mount namespaces. On the x-axis, uh, we have the number of long-lived mount namespaces persisting throughout the experiment. On the y-axis, uh, we measure how many namespaces can we create and delete within a second. Uh, observe that the churn performance scales very poorly uh, with the number of uh, prior existing namespaces. As the number of host mounts grow, uh, the rate at which namespace can be cloned approaches to zero. An alternative way is to actually use uh, the good old chroot operation. chroot simply uh, turns a subdirectory of the original root file system into the new root file system. Uh, we lose the capabilities that mount uh, provides, but in functional service, since we are using the base image, chroot simply serves our purpose. Uh, so while allocating storage, the two optimizations that we can perform for functional service over Docker containers are these. First, use uh, bind mounting instead of union file systems. Second, use chroot operation instead of uh, mount namespaces. Uh, next, let's look at the time consumed by namespaces during container startup. Uh, so figure three shows the latency of four most expensive uh, namespace operations. Here, uh, we include the create, create and cleanup uh, operations in across all namespaces. Uh, the four most expensive ones are shown in figure three. Uh, so the uh, mount and the IPC cleanup take about 10, uh, 10 milliseconds. Uh, this is the uh, RCU grace period on Linux. So uh, like there's a single uh, global lock that's being held and there's no nothing running on CPU. So this is uh, kind of irrelevant for our discussion. Uh, the most expensive operation is uh, basically network namespace creation. Uh, as we try to uh, create namespaces concurrently, uh, as we try to create more of them concurrently, the latency shoots up. This is because uh, there's a single global lock uh, 
that has to be shared across the namespaces uh, during uh, creation. So when there are, there's more concurrency, the, the congestion on that lock is higher. Uh, network cleanup also has uh, similar performance issues. Uh, but since clean, uh, but a cleanup is actually done in batches. So the per namespace uh, cleanup uh, reduces uh, as it's shown in the downward trend in the graph. Uh, network namespaces the, in, like alone cause a lot of uh, damage to, uh, to the throughput of uh, container creation. Figure four actually highlights that problem. Uh, so uh, the x-axis shows the concurrent number of operations. Here an operation uh, is a docker, is a container create or uh, delete. So what we do is we create a container, uh, execute a no-op instruction and then delete the container. Uh, we uh, vary the uh, network namespace configuration. We start with vanilla, which is the docker container. Then we uh, have an optimized version where, uh, where they disable IPv6 and uh, optimize some uh, some uh, uh, bro broadcasting code. Uh, then we uh, we do not create any name, uh, network namespace on the containers. Uh, we simply use the host uh, namespace. Uh, if we observe the throughput for no network namespace, uh, the peak is at 900. For optimized, the peak is at 400, and for vanilla Docker containers, the peak is at 200. So if we do not create any network namespaces, uh, there's a four and a half times increase in the uh, throughput of container creation. Uh, now most of the now the hosts and containers are managed by the cloud provider, and the cloud provider typically uses network address translators for uh, on on their hosts. <coughs> so network namespaces are uh, basically useless for uh, in functional service. Uh, so we might as well get away with them. So in fast containers that are optimized, uh, we basically do not create any names network namespace uh, to increase the throughput of container creation. The last step in container creation is to create and assign C groups to process in the container. Uh, there are two ways we can carry out this uh, C group management. The first way is to create a C group for every new container we launch and attach processes uh, to the cre newly created C group. Uh, when the container finishes execution, we have to remove uh, the process from the C group, C group and delete the created C group. Uh, on the contrary, what we can do is reuse C groups across containers. Uh, so we maintain a pool of C groups with different configurations uh, and attach a container to, the rele to a relevant uh, C group in the pool. And once the container finishes execution, just remove the processes from this container uh, from the C group. Uh, so we can save upon creating and deleting C groups for every single container. Uh, figure five shows the performance difference between uh, reusing C groups versus creating C groups for uh, every container. Uh, the operation here is we create a container, we launch a no-op instruction. Once that finishes, we delete the container. Uh, so we can observe that when we reuse C groups, the throughput is at least twice uh, as good as when we create C groups for each container. So to so let's summarize all the optim so uh, let's summarize all the optimizations that we uh, discussed for fast uh, compared to Docker containers. So we used bind mounts compared to Union file system on Docker containers. Instead of using na mount namespace, we use chroot to change the directory uh, of the container. Then uh, we remove network namespaces uh, from the containers. Uh, finally, uh, we use C group, uh, we reuse C groups across containers by maintaining pools of C groups on the host. In order to evaluate the benefits of all the uh, container optimizations that we just discussed, SOC concurrently invoked no-op functions using either Docker or SOC as the container engine. Uh, the figure in this slide shows the request throughput on the y -ax, on the x-axis and average latency on the y-axis as we vary the number of concurrent uh, outstanding requests. SOC is strictly faster on both metrics regardless of concurrency. For 10 concurrent requests, SOC has a throughput of 76 requests per second. This is 18 times faster than Docker 
and the average latency is uh, 130 milliseconds and that is 19 times faster than docker uh, so having a sound understanding of uh, namespaces and c groups uh, SOC was able to uh, leverage this knowledge and apply it to function as a service and achieve much higher uh, thru uh, throughput and latency in container creation in this particular space. Uh, so I hope this serves as a good model uh, to carry out research in containers and see how we can optimize uh, containerization for uh, different uh, fields.